Good morning. Today's lecture will be about the scanner and especially scanner creation tools. And I've written Lex, Flex and Flex again here. Uh, the original version of the tool we're going to look at uh, was called Lex. Uh, then we have a newer version which is called Flex, uh, which is uh, opens an open source implementation of the original Lex. And <coughs> when you start the actual program it will be Flex with uh, lowercase f. And also we should mention that there is um, um, some sort of uh, tool from Adobe, I think, to uh, uh, build web pages that blink and flash uh, as a replacement for the old shockwave. So this is the tool we will be working with. And <coughs> since that tool uses regular expressions to specify uh, the tokens, uh, we will look at regular expressions and also at state machines because state machines is a way to implement uh, a program that understands regular expressions. Or rather, you translate the regular expression to a state machine. Okay? Uh, you remember <coughs> the scanner, it's the first part of the um, uh, compiler. You read the source code which is typically a sequence of characters, let's say uh, 57.2 with spaces and new lines and stuff. And what the scanner does is it ignores all the spaces, so we don't need to worry about those. And it gives us uh, a pair. Uh, which token type is it? It's a number. And also what we call the lexical value, which number? Token type, lexical value. And maybe you remember that the actual characters are called the lexeme. Same word as in lexical analyzer and lexicon. And the reason to have a separate part of the compiler, which is the scanner that handles this, is well to split things up into modules that don't interact to each other except by this, uh, <coughs> uh, this communication. Uh, if you have um, studied some uh, computer engineering, or rather uh, software engineering, uh, you remember maybe low module coupling. If you have split your program into modules, the coupling, they shouldn't interfere with each other. You shouldn't have, let's say, global variables that uh, they can interact through in unpredictable ways. And here, you have a very clear and well-defined interface between uh, the modules, between the scanner and what, what happens next. Okay. Lex now. <coughs> you remember uh, the parser generator Bison from uh, the previous lecture, you uh, <coughs> had an input file and it's the same with flex. You have a flex input file. And just as with Bison, you have three ports. You have uh, one port for declarations and definitions declarations. You have one port for the actual rules that define the tokens and you have one port for any C code you might need. You run this through 
flex. Roller flex like this. And out from it you will get a C file. which is always called lex.yy.c. And by, def uh, by convention, we usually call this input file something point, uh, .l. So if it's intended to be part of a Java compiler, you would call it java.l, where l, of course, stands for either lex or lexical analyzer. And these rules <coughs> where you specify the tokens, here you use the regular expressions. So we'll look now more into regular expressions, since those are uh, the ones we will have to use. So, regular expressions. Or in Swedish, reguljära uttryck. You can write normal characters, A, B, C. Well, this is a regular expression and it matches A, B, C, that particular word. Uh, <coughs> normal characters. You have also the star. And it's not like in uh, uh, some shells and uh, the command prompt at Windows that you can write, for example, delete star dot star. And uh, the star means any sequence of characters. That is not what this star means. This is what is called a clean star. Uh, <coughs> what it means is zero or more occurrences of the previous thing. So, an example is if I write a star, that can be either empty, it can be an A, it can be two A's, it can be three A's, and so on. And you can use parentheses to group things together. So, for example, if I write a B store, uh, that would mean that I have one single A and then zero or more Bs. But if I write a B within parentheses and then a store, that would mean zero or more occurrences of a, b. So it, it's either empty, or it's a, b, or it's a, b, a, b, or it's a, b, a, b, a, b, and so on. And you have this uh, <coughs> one or the other or or sign. Meaning one or the other. So for example, if you have um, a or B, well, then it's either A or B. And you can combine this with, with the parentheses. So, for example, if you have uh, <coughs> A or B followed by C, well, then it's A or B 
and then followed by a C, always a C. Um, can it be uh, uh, A, B, C? Is, will it match? This one, yeah. no, it will not, because this is one either A or B, okay. not both. Yeah. Now, we'll see there are more <coughs> things to re typical regular expressions, uh, implementations of regular expressions have more things than this, but these are the basics. And we can use them to, uh, we can use them to th just these basic uh, things in regular expressions. For example, an identifier in most programming languages that we use uh, is, well, what is the format of an identifier? Well, it's a letter followed by zero or more, either letters or numbers. So, example identifiers, x, x1, x, y, z, 2, 3, x, 2. But not something that starts with a number, because then it will be interpreted as a number. So, how would we do that? Well, <clears throat> We have no way using these uh, simple mechanisms to say that something has to be a letter. So we have to list all the letters that can be used. So it would look something like this, A or B or C or D or E or F or G or H. Or... Yeah. Uh, let's say that the alphabet that we use ends at J. So this would be the first character, and then we have A or B or C or D or E or H or I or J, and all the numbers Zero or more occurrences. And of course, this would be too annoying. So we have more mechanisms that we can use uh, in our regular expressions. One thing that we can use is uh, macros, like similar to macros in the C preprocessor. You can give a name to, well, let's say this part here and call it letter. If I do that, I can say that a letter will expand to A or B or C or D or E or F or J or H or Y or J, and as you remember, we say that our alphabet ends with J. We don't have any more letters. And I can have a digit that is 0 or 1 or 2 or 3 or 4 or 5 or 6 or 7 or 8 or 9. And now I can <coughs> specify my identifier using letter and digit to say that an identifier is, and let me do it the wrong way first. For, first a letter, and then uh, either let any number of letters or any number of digits, like this, zero or more letters. I mean, we said that an identifier is a single letter followed by any number of letters or any number of digits, right? So what's wrong with this one? What does it say? You can either have only letters or only digits. Yeah. You start with a letter, okay, and then either any number of letters or any number of digits. So when you've chosen to use letters or digits, well, then it stops there. 
you can only have letters or digits. So this one wouldn't work, for example. So instead of this, we could write, well, again, you start with a letter. And then you have either a letter or a digit and any number of that choice. So first letter and then any number of letters or digits. But since you repeat this entire or parenthesis, uh, you can mix letters and digits. Okay. Another example using just this. Unsigned real numbers, such as, well, 17 would be one, but you can also have decimals. And you can have things like 6.23e minus 23. So you can have scientific notation with uh, an exponent. How do we write a regular expression for that? Well, assuming we can use macros, uh, we'll probably start with saying that, okay, a digit is zero or one or two or three or four or five or six or seven or eight or nine. And you will have sequences of digits, like one, seven, or longer sequences. So let's create another macro called digits. And now, since we have been working with uh, <coughs> grammars, it may seem natural for us to say that, okay, what's digits? Well, it's either one single digit, followed by more digits, or it's one single digit. This is how we would write it in a grammar. But that will not work for regular expressions, because it's recursive. And those of you who did, um, already did lab one will know that macros cannot be recursive, at least not in C, because they have to be expanded So, if we try to actually expand this, it would say that, okay, digit is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Digits then is the same thing, and you would keep expanding forever. So, this does not work. No recursive regular expressions. That makes it suitable for specifying tokens to the scanner, because the scanner usually, the tokens in the scanner are usually much simpler than the program that the parser will understand. So a single token like a number is comparatively very simple. But what do we do instead? Well, <clears throat> I can say that digits Okay, it has always to start with the digit. And I can have more digits. If I did this, well, it works to just insert uh, this definition here, but then it also matches zero digits. And if I want to say that there has to be digits, then I don't want to let to be able to leave it empty. So instead of digit store, we do digit digit store, 
one single digit followed by zero or more digits. And we can expand this like macros in C. This is the first digit and then the second digit with a star. So everything can be expanded to uh, basic regular expressions without macros. So what would this be? Well, <coughs> the fraction part is optional and also the exponent part is also optional. What about the optional fraction part? Well, let's call it optional fraction. And the optional fraction is, as you can see, one single point followed by digits. And you have to have an optional empty port because since the fraction is optional you can leave okay and to be clear we might want to put parentheses around here uh, usually um, the OR has lower precedence than uh, simple concatenation, where you just write things after each other, but it's not wrong to add some parentheses. And we'll see later that when we use actual real regular expressions, uh, <coughs> they've ha they usually use uh, the, po the uh, dot here to mean uh, any character, but in this case we, we only use the basics. So, uh, the period character means just that. Okay, optional fraction. We also have an optional uh, exponent. Which is... an E. And in reality, I think you can use a lowercase e also, but let's ignore that. Uh, then you can have a minus sign. Uh, you can leave it empty. Or you can have a plus sign. So here comes either plus, minus, or nothing. Then you get digits, or leave everything empty, since the entire fraction part was uh, the entire exponent part was optional. And now we can define our complete real number as uh, first digits then optional fraction and then optional exponents. Like this. And notice that this does not allow uh, this uh, American way of writing decimal numbers with without a zero. I could just say optional digits here. Do the same thing for the digits. 
so I can skip the digits. But then you have three optional ports, and you don't say that you have, you have to have any of them. So you could, then you would allow for unsigned real numbers that are completely empty, and we don't want that. Okay. Let's continue with regular expressions and the more um, realistic types of regular expressions that you will actually find in, uh, in um, uh, programs. Because you don't want to write things like this. More regular expression things. Uh, the first thing that we will use is this point, which means any character. Usually, except new line. Because most, in most um, uh, contexts, when we work with regular expressions, we work with only one line of text at a time. If you need to work with new line, well then you have the normal, the way you recognize from C and other languages. You can write it like that. We have uh, the same things we had before, this uh, star and the OR and the parenthesis, as before. And since we saw at least one example where we wanted to have one or more, we use this, we use plus to mean one or more occurrences, as opposed to the star that meant zero or more. And if you can have one or more, and if you can have zero or more, maybe we want zero or one. And you can use the question mark to mean zero or one. Occurrences of the thing before. So let's say a question mark uh, means either the letter A or nothing. If you want to look at lines, then the up arrow means uh, beginning of line. And uh, the dollar sign end of line. So if you, for example, want to match, um, let's say you have uh, a mail filtering tool that lets you uh, sort your mail based on the subject line. And then you look at the uh, text of the mail, the message, and as you know, it's all text, and how do you find the header lines with the subject and so on? Well, the subject line starts with subject. So if you want to match only the subject line, it would look like this. Uh, so not subject colon anywhere on a line, but it has to start with subject colon. And then if you can put anything on that line, well, point star means any number of characters of any type. And you can add end of line also. So if you, for example, want to filter your mail to throw away all the mails about um, money, because usually they are spam, you could say something like this, uh, 
any number of characters and then it says money and then any number of more characters. Okay. We can also use double quotes to uh, actually mean this particular character. So if I want to match an actual up arrow, or if I want to match, let's say, <coughs> an actual pair of parentheses, I can quote them using these quotation marks. And then the really interesting part is what we call character classes. Uh, if I say ABC, like this, then it's one of the characters within those square brackets. So this is the same as saying A or B or C. And the interesting part with this is you can have uh, intervals a to D. Then you get all the characters from A to D. So this is A or B or C or D. And you can use these to quote them if you want to actually say uh, that your input should match square bracket A minus D and square bracket, then you can put it in double quotes. And if you want to use the, the minus sign, uh, if I write it like this, this means, okay, it matches either A or a minus character or D. So this is the same as saying A or minus or D. And it has to be an interval that starts with something. If I try to match everything up to and including D, well, where does that start? Does it include all the uppercase characters and all the numbers, which it would do if uh, I just lo look at character codes? Or do I mean just the lower, what, what I mean here? No, this doesn't, this is not an interval. This actually means just either minus or D. Because it can't be interpreted as an interval. So it is the minus uh, character I mean. This means A or minus or D because I quoted this minus with a backslash. And uh, you can have several intervals and several characters. So if I say A, B, C to A, B, D to F and H, this means, okay, it's A or B and then D, E or F, because the interval was D, E or F, and then you can have H. So if I, for example, wanted to have something that matches all alphanumeric characters, that is, any, char uh, any uppercase letter, any lowercase letter, and any normal decimal number, I could write something like this, A to Z, and now I assume uh, English letters. If I try to match Swedish characters, you know, after Z we have O, Ä, Ö. And the final letter in the alphabet is Ö. Or O with umlaut. Uh, 
this is likely to fail horribly because what most uh, regular expression implementations do is they just look at the character, code, character codes and this will be something strange which is not uh, part of the normal sequence of characters so <coughs> avoid things like that. You could match white space uh, just looking like you can use uh, backslash n to mean a new line. Uh, you can use backslash t to mean a tab character. And of course, uh, this is a normal space character I drew, I drew there. Uh, this means one white space character. And if you want to match white space and throw it away usually, uh, add a plus so it's one or more white space characters. And usually what the scanner does with white space is to throw it away except inside strings where it has to be preserved and used as a separator. So if you have two tokens uh, with white space between them, you cannot usually merge them together. Uh, they are two separate tokens. We should look at this also, not a, b. And what does this mean? Does it mean uh, not an A, but it can be a B? Well, that would be a bit strange because if it's not an A, well, obviously you can have a B because B is not an A. So what this means is not any character except not A or B. So all the characters that can, comes after the uh, up arrow means uh, those are not allowed. And it has to come at the start, so if you have something like a up arrow b, uh, again, we might think it means it can be an a or anything except b, but if it can be anything except b, it could also be a, so we don't need a. So what this actually means is, then we actually mean the up arrow character, so this is a or up arrow or B. So what does this mean? A or B? Uh, or, uh, the, the or yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, this is not uh, A or B. It does not mean this matches the character A and the character B. Uh, what it does mean is it's either A or this OR operator or, or character or B. Because obviously you don't need to write an OR inside this if you mean A or B. Then you would just say A, B like this. So it matches A and B. So as I said, um, the reason we look at regular expressions is because these are uh, what we use as input to flex when we want to generate a scanner. So now we will look more in detail at how the uh, flex input file looks. The flex input file and uh, <coughs> as I said we usually call it uh, something dot L so if um, uh, it's for some language which we can call language 
Uh, then the file is usually called language.l. And the first part was declarations. And just as in uh, Bison, the parser generator, uh, we can have C declarations at the start between these. So if the scanner needs to uh, print things, uh, we would include stdio.h, but usually the scanner doesn't print things. But we could. For example, error messages. Uh, <coughs> if we are working uh, as part of a larger program, such as uh, something that has a parser generated by Bison, you remember that Bison generates an include file with definitions of the token types. So, if we had language.y as input to Bison, you get a file called language.tab.age, which contains digit, etc. Uh, the various token types. So the scanner knows what to return when it's found a digit. Or a number or anything. Okay. The next part <coughs> is flex macros, like the type we saw here, uh, letter and digit and so on. But we'll continue with that after the break. Okay. So <coughs> let us continue. Let us continue with uh, this input file to flex where we specify our, uh, our scanner. And you remember we said earlier that if we're using Bison, it will generate a file for us called, well, whatever the input file was called, .tab.h, which defines <coughs> uh, numbers that we can return from the scanner when we have found a certain type of token, for example, a digit. And you also remember that we said that we have a variable called yylval, which is the lexical value. So we might to want to extern declare this one, extern int yylval, so we can use that to return which digit we found, for example. Uh, now comes the macro part. <laughs> for example, if I want to uh, specify a delimiter which separates tokens, which is white space. So, uh, sorry, uh, square bracket. A normal space character can be a delimiter, also a tab character and a new line character, like this. And end square bracket. So now we have a macro that says delimiter <coughs> and if we want to specify that white space has to be at least one of those delimiter characters, so I can say WS for white space is. Uh, I'm not going to write delim plus like this because then it would mean D E L I and then at least one M. So I have to use curly brackets around the macro name. And I can say that the letter, as we did before, is A to Z and A to Z lowercase. And digit 0 to 9. Then we come to the main port of the input file. <coughs> you remember percent percent to get to the next port. Uh, 
And here I can say that, okay, what do we do when we have found white space? And now I can use the macros, white space. Well, what do we do with white space? Nothing, we just ignore it. So here I write some code and I say, uh, just to clarify for anyone who reads this code that I didn't forget to put anything within these uh, curly brackets. I just actually want to ignore white space. I write white space. If I have keywords that I want to match, let's say the keyword while, then I can write while. And then assuming we have defined uh, a macro in language.tab.h that can be used to return a number when we have found the keyword while, I can return uppercase while if we assume that is the macro or, or enum. And other uh, keywords. Now, note that it is case sensitive. Typically, all regular expressions are case sensitive, since we, for example, used to have uh, needed to do. Uh, this to recognize a letter. Uh, so this matches else with only lowercase. This on the hand, on the other hand, matches well else with a uppercase e and then lowercase letters. So I could uh, do this. Or if I want to match else with any combination of uppercase and lowercase, I would have to write something like this. And since many languages were developed using uh, flex, maybe this is the reason that keywords are usually case sensitive. If we wanted to have case insensitive keywords, we would, would need to write this. Uh, an identifier, what would that be? Well, we saw that it's one letter followed by either letter or uh, digit and any number. And here I would return ID if we found an identifier. Almost I would return ID because when I found an identifier in the input, uh, I need to let the rest of the compiler know which identifier it was. So we need first to uh, look it up in the symbol table. So before here, there, uh, I need to set yyl now to, well, whatever I look up in the symbol table and I get a number that is the number of this identifier. If you look at the 2.9 program, you can see how the scanner there does this. Say again, what is the difference between this? Uh, this is uppercase E, this is lowercase E. And regular expressions or case sensitive. So if you want to match both, you need to write both here. Okay. And if you found a number, well, we have digit here, but a number, if I say digit plus, then it's 
ser, uh, one or more digits. So I would set yyl val to something. Uh, simplest way to do this is to say a to i, if it's c, a to i. Uh, and then there is a variable that is called yy text that conti contains the lexeme for this particular token. So if we found 152, which matches digit plus, then yy text contains this string 152. So I can send it to the function a to i, which uh, just converts from uh, string to number. It does not check for error, so if I had a very long sequence of uh, digits, uh, I would get the wrong result here. And then I want to return, well, maybe it's called number, like this. Something is very noisy. Um, end of um, this simple input file. Okay. And, um, well, you could have put C code down here if you wanted C code for something. Okay. I have a <coughs> another simple example on my computer here. So let's um, see if I can get this one working. So let's see, can you read this? Yes, yes. Yeah. Let's do clear. As you can see in this uh, directory I have Two files, parser.y and scanner.l, not very imaginatively named, but the scanner.l is the specification for the scanner and parser.y for the parser. And if we look at the parser.y, you remember the uh, input file for Bison. Uh, <coughs> we had this um, part where we uh, can have C declarations, and I include stdio.h because I want to print things. I don't want to read things from the input because the scanner handles that for us. And I have a number of tokens, word, number, and stop. And my language now that I'm going to parse consists of a list of words and numbers ending in a period. Uh, a dot, stop, which means stop. So the start symbol here says I have a list followed by stop, and that list is one thing followed by another list, or it's empty. And the thing is either a word or a number. Okay? And what I do in my main function here, I put that in the uh, parser.y file, so uh, I only ha need to link together the parser and the scanner so it works. Uh, I call yyparse, which is this, the parser that Bison generates for us. And if I uh, scroll further down, you remember maybe that I mentioned that you have to have a function called yyerror that is called when you get a parse error. Uh, yyrep is a function that is needed for uh, if we end the input, should we stop reading or should we start again? Wrap it up or not? Uh, that was the parser. So I can have uh, lists of words and number ending with a, uh, a stop. And let's then look at the uh, scanner.l. And it's a bit simpler. <coughs> I include, you remember, parser.tab.h, which is the include file that Bison generates, which tells us 
if I want to return, okay, I found a word, I found a number, what is word, what is number? Those are just codes that used, uh, maybe word is 257. Uh, it's just a code we use to communicate between the scanner and the parser. And here we have A to Z. Well, any number of lowercase characters is a word. Any number of uh, digits is a number. A single dot means stop. So that's the end of the input. And everything else, just ignore it. Okay? So let's, if we have uh, parser.y and scanner.l, uh, let's uh, run bison on the parser. Uh, seems to work okay, and if I do ls now, you see suddenly I have these two files, parser.tab.c and parser.tab.h. And if I want to run flex on the scanner, uh, on the scanner specification, uh, no error messages, and if I list now, I also have the file lex.yy.c. So now I have two C code files that are code for the scanner and the parser. And I can compile them. GCC uh, oh, uh, uh, um, I call my program, my program list reader. Uh, and what I compile is lex and parser.tab.c. Those two C files. And I get some warnings here because um, the code generated here um, I get warnings from the generated code. And if I had written um, some things more cleverly, I might have um, not had this. But uh, those are just warnings. So if I do ls, you see I now have the program list reader. So I can use that list reader. And you remember it <coughs> lets me th write things like, hello, hello, hi-ho, numbers, words, numbers, words, end with point, like this. And it says nothing. Why does it say nothing? Well, I haven't said, I haven't put any semantic actions in the parser.y file. So it just, okay, it accepts it. It's okay according to the grammar. If I continue writing hello again, then I get a syntax error. And the reason I get a syntax error, well, that is that if we again look at, uh, no, correction, if we look at uh, the specification for the parser, the grammar. So <clears throat> I have a list followed by stop. I had that. But then I try to write more things afterwards. And then, of course, it stops. It gives an error. If I tried to... Oh, it will be difficult to get a syntax error here. Let's say that I, if I uh, edit uh, the parser here, and say that my list, uh, my input must always start with a word. So it says word, and then comes a list of things that can be words or numbers. If I do this, and then also let me add a semantic action at the end here. So when we have parsed the input, uh, according to the grammar, it says print OK. So it prints OK. So let's run bison. Symbol word, but it's not defined. Oh, correction. Um, it has to be uppercase word because the token is called uppercase word, not lowercase word. So, and then I compile everything. I can write, uh, sorry, this. Uh, 
in Unix like systems uh, exclamation mark something means redo the previous command that started with uh, GCC. So, and now I have a new list reader. And as you, as you remember, now we ha have to start with a word. So we can't start with a number, then we get syntax error. Uh, we can start with a word, hello. And as you may remember also, we didn't say that end of line should be handled in a specific way. So that's just a garbage character. So we continue. And write more things. And when we uh, print the point in the input, then uh, when we type a point in the input, uh, you get the OK. And now I can't write anything more because if I do, then we get the syntax error. Because the grammar says that it should end after the stop. OK? What might be interesting here is to look at this generated C code from the parser and the scanner. Is it something we can then uh, work with? Well, let's look at the generated parser.tab.c, the actual parser. Well, first some uh, comments, and then uh, some macros, and then some more macros, and even more macros and lots of macros, and hundreds of macros, and then tables, and some more tables, and some macros, and various types of code here. Well, the point is that this is not code that you're supposed to look at, unless there is an error, maybe you need to look at it then. But this is uh, generated code that is supposed to be compiled. It's not something you will then save and continue working with. It's like the assembler that is generated by a compiler. Uh, you don't save that generated assembler code and work with that unless you have to because it doesn't work for some reason. Uh, this is just generated code that is part of the build process. It's not source code anymore. It's not really source code. And the same thing uh, with um, yy, no correction, uh, with lex.yy.c. It's also this um, hard to read for humans code with macros, macros, even more macros, uh, and then tables, which Again, we're not supposed really to look at these and understand them. Okay? Good. Next item on today's uh, list of things is uh, state machines. So let me... Uh, Turn this off. And erase this and we'll look at state machines. Or, <coughs> well, a state machine or a finite state automaton, plural automata, uh, or uh, finite uh, automaton, one finite automaton, uh, that is something that has states that we move between. And I guess you have seen, maybe at least some of you, have seen things like this in courses, maybe about networks, how you have different states on a network connection. Is it connected? Is it trying to connect? And so on. Uh, the finite part of finite state machines is that you have a finite number of states. If you have an analog machine, let's say with uh, 
you have uh, a slider that lets you uh, move the slider to regulate the volume, then at least in theory you have an infinite number of states. You can move it as little as, as you wish. Uh, then you get down to a quantum level and it's not really true, but uh, you don't have a, clearly, a set of clearly defined states like you have in a finite machine like this. And then uh, you can move between these states. You have a start state. So you start in one place, let's say one. And you have an end state where you get there, uh, <coughs> you're finished. And then you move between the states. Maybe you can move from one to two, from two back to one, and from two to three. And when we're working with um, input to a program, such as a scanner does, then uh, we will look at the input. Let's say the characters in the input. And let's say we are in state A, one, and we get the character A, that will mean we move to state two. And if we are in state two, well, if we get the character B, we move back to state one. If we get the character A, we, want, we go to the end state. And now, which input will get us to the end state? Which inputs will get us to the end state? Say again? A? A? Or? B star A. B star. So if I get a B first. No, A, B. A, B star A. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, if you go do A, if you get A, B, then you get back to one. And then if you get A, A, you get to the end. But if you get A, B, and A, B again, then you get back to the start. So, as you said, we have A, B, any number of A, B, followed by A, A. Which is a regular expression. So, a way to implement a regular expression, to actually uh, match that regular expression to the input, is a state machine. We also call this a deterministic state machine. Well, this doesn't work. Or deterministic finite, again, because we only have a finite number of states. Uh, and the deterministic part is that we always know which transition to perform. If you had something like this, A, you get an A when you're a state one, and you don't know if you should go to directly to three or to two. Uh, if we again assume 3 is the end state, uh, then it's a non-deterministic state machine because, well, you can use, you can go either there or there. Uh, what's the use of a non-deterministic state machine? Well, let's see uh, B, and it's probably better that we have another state that makes it clearer. Uh, we have add an end state 4. Here. What inputs will get us to the end state? Well, it is A, B, C, or A, C. So this is a little bit like a first conflict for a grammar. Uh, you're here, you get an A, and you don't know if you want to go there or there. Uh, we could sort of follow all the possibilities and see where that get us, gets us, and maybe backtrack when we found, uh, found something that doesn't work. But 
these can be uh, a non-deterministic state machine can be transformed using an algorithm to a finite state machine. Uh, I mean to a deterministic state machine. Can we write uh, a star c? This one? A star c, no. That would match, for example, this. But it would not match... A star c would match this, which this does not match. Because we have no... no uh, transition back to let us have any number of A's. And, I mean, <coughs> one way of transforming this is to say that, oh, I always start with an A. So, then I can do something else. Because both then, oh, well, it is possible, it's always possible to transform this non-deterministic state machine to a deterministic one. Okay. So, why state machines? Why um, why bother talking about them? Uh, if we use Flex, it will work with state machines internally, but we can ignore that. We don't need to worry about it. But why do we want to look at state machines? Well, they can be useful. For example, if you're writing a scanner without the help of Flex, or something else that is similar to writing a scanner. Let's say we have a word counting program. Let me remove these. I want to write a program that is a word counter. It counts the number of words in the input. For example, I start with a space, a space, hi, space, 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 Hi, there, space, space, you, space, 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 and then uh, end of line. So here it ends. So how many words do we have in this input? Well, we have one, two, Three. And how do we write a program that uh, <coughs> counts words? Well, I can't count numbers. I can't count space. Uh, I can't count letters because we have words that consist of several letters. I can't count spaces because I have maybe lots of spaces. Uh, I could maybe do something like, okay, if it's a space and then the next character is a letter, then I found the beginning of a word and then I loop through. But then, what if it starts with a letter? So, in this case, it is useful to think of this as a state machine problem. You have two states. If you read through the input, you have the state of being inside a word and not being inside a word. Not inside, or I could say outside word. And the state inside word. These two states. And when we start, well, we're not inside a word when we start the program. So this is the start state. No matter if uh, <coughs> this is, uh, we have spaces at the start or not, we are not inside a word yet. So we look at each character as we get it. Well, if I get a space and I'm not inside a word, 
then I'm still not inside the world. So anything at least that's not a letter, a space, let's say we have spaces and letters in the input, that's all we have. Uh, but if I'm not inside a word and suddenly there is a letter, well, then I have moved to being inside a word. Okay. If I am inside a word, okay. If I get another letter, then I'm still inside a word. So letters moves us back. But if I get a space, And I'm inside a word. I'm inside a word, inside a word, inside a word. Oh, now I get a space. Then I'm suddenly outside a word, right? So space gets us back to not inside a word. We have no end state. So maybe we should also uh, <coughs> try to think about what happens when we get, reaches the end. So, if I get, not a space, but end of line, or the end of input. Uh, okay, if I'm not inside a word, uh, end of input. If it's not inside a word, then I get to the end state. Done. Also, if I am inside a word, I also go to the end state, if I reach the end of the input. So I have three possibilities. Letter, space and end of input. Where should I increment our word counter? Yeah, we could do that. But then we miss the, we forget if we are at the end and the word ends. Or the opposite, when we go to inside the word. Yeah, I mean, we will always start in the state not inside word. So here, when we found the letter, so here in this transition, uh, this says word count plus plus. So increment the word count variable. And if we do this as a program, you would say something like this, okay, I have the variable word count. I set it to zero. I have uh, the state. And I can uh, number them, zero, one, two, and three. Or I can say inside word is set to zero, maybe to make the code a bit easier to understand. And then I have a while loop, while uh, c equals get sure, while it's not, uh, let's say end of file, it ends the file. Uh, <coughs> I do, and then I have the state transitions here. Uh, if inside word. Well, what, what do I do when I'm inside a word? Well, if it's a letter I found, if uh, is letter, there's a macro in C type dot H that says is letter. If is letter, well, I do nothing because I'm still inside a word. So let's add a null statement. You can have a single semicolon or a line like this. Uh, else, and I uh, uh, actually, I will never get end of input because I used this up here to jump out of the loop. But else, uh, if I'm inside a word and I found something that's not a letter, then inside word is now zero. Else, if I am not inside a word, well, then it's the opposite. If is letter C, if I found a letter, then I will, first of all, move to this new state. 
inside word equals one, and I don't need, I must not forget word count plus plus. Like this. And there's also an else that does nothing. Uh, <coughs> if I get something that's not a letter, I will just move back to not the inside word. So this is a useful way of thinking. And it can be used for slightly more complicated things. Let's say that I also want to be able to uh, uh, write quoted strings. I can write, hi there, Bob Jones. And since I had double quotes here, I want this to count as a word. So I have one word, two words, three words. But this word has a space in it. Now, this state machine and this program, uh, assuming uh, this is counts as a letter because it's not a space, uh, I will get four words. But I want to have three words. Well, then I can add to this state machine that if I find a quote, then I get to inside quoted string. And then I move around, I, I stay inside the quoted string as long as it's not another quote. So if I get another quote, I move back out to not the inside word. Otherwise, I just keep moving here if I have a, a letter or space. Okay? So state machines can be useful to think, uh, to use in various uh, places. Okay. Any questions? Then we're finished for today. Thank you.